On Tuesday, Dr. Braxton Hunter, president of Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, put out a video with seven questions for Christian YouTubers. I'm not a YouTuber, but here's a not very well kept secret I'd rather be a YouTuber than a blogger. In a future world, I might get there. I tried to do a video curriculum for the Kung Fu Club that I ran a few years ago, but my personality is incompatible with the editing process. That added to my already poor mental health and I had a fairly severe breakdown before I got very far into it and ended up hospitalized for a week. Trying to edit videos didn't lead to my hospitalization, but it didn't pull me back from the brink the way that writing has a number of times since then. So if I went that way, it would probably be haphazard and random posting instead of the regular posting that I do on my blog. Unless I got to a point where I could hire an editor, or I figured out a way to make videos that didn't need editing, or something like that. The questions Dr. Hunter asked are not very specific to YouTube, which I considered to be a blessing for me. It means that I get to pretend that I'm a YouTuber for a few minutes while I answer the questions. The questions aren't related to editing software or the like. It's just philosophy and theology. I have thoughts on those things. So listed below are Dr. Hunter's 7 questions for YouTubers, which I've totally bastardized for me as a blogger. The questions are rewritten in the first person, because that's how I decided to do it. At the time of publication, I have watched verses or read responses from the following YouTubers. The Apologetics. Rev Reads. C4C Apologetics. Testify. My Mind's Dark Depths. Toads. Walking Through the Scriptures with Joseph Bakoda. Daryl King. Introverted Christian. Barreto Family. Theology Geek Fitness. Question 1. What do I mean when I say that I'm a Christian? Uh, the first thing I do is moderate my definitions to the person I'm talking with. I've had more than a dozen conversations where I've said, in that case, I'm not a Christian, I believe in the Bible. I've ended up in that place with both self-identified Christians and non-Christians. This is one of those questions where, if I were in a slightly more snarky mood, I would say, my philosophy of language is incompatible with this question. However, if I said that in any kind of earnestness, I'm not sure I could still use the term as a self-identifier. When someone asks me what my religion is, the first definition I give is usually, Christian. If that's not enough detail, then I'll say I'm non-denominational Christian. Those that wasn't more granularity than that get, I'm an Augustinian Neoplatonist. Identifying as a Christian, I mean that I believe and affirm every line in the three traditional creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. As a non-denominational Christian, I don't believe that those destined for God's kingdom can be readily and easily identified in the current world, either by theology, group membership, or activity, nor do I think that any group or historic teacher has an impeccable theology. When I say that I'm an Augustinian Neoplatonist, I mean that if you would identify the 5th century theologian as mostly orthodox, and wouldn't hold that he brings in what was then current philosophy and theology into his theological explorations, then we will get along just fine. If you're going to condemn him because he was willing to see more than one layer to scripture and didn't always and only stick to the most simplistic reading then we're a lot less likely to be buddies. Question 2. What is the purpose of your blog? Uh, these days it's mostly for my own mental health. It started out as a way to store data I was using for my amateur Bible translation. Back in the day, before there was Google Docs, the easiest way I knew of to get a bunch of free text data storage online for my amateur Bible translation files was to get a blog. We were strapped for money and I'd just had a few hard drive failures that almost cost me everything. I had spent the better part of two years transcribing Hebrew manuscript 132 from the National Library of Paris so that I could compare and translate easily. Thumb drives were still pretty new and not all that reliable, and after my back-to-back -back crashes I scoured my collection of 3.5-inch floppy disks to find a backup. Fortunately, I had one. I wanted some kind of online backup, something that didn't depend on the stability of my physical environment so much. About the same time we lost a child. I didn't get back to my translation project for a while. In the meantime, a bunch of King James onlyists had found me and said some very hateful things. Being so recent after the loss of my son, 
I wasn't ready to be told that I was a heretic for translating from a non-standard source by a bunch of people that didn't know me or that I was abusing my non-existent non-profit status. So I deleted everything and walked away for a few years. My mental health took a turn for the worse, then spiraled until I had a breakdown that landed me in the hospital. Therapy didn't help me. Someone suggested journaling, so when I had a thought spinning in my head that I couldn't get out, I would put it up on my blog. Being me, most of them are religious or philosophically related, and a not insignificant subset early on were defending my choices of source in my translation or style choices in my translation, stuff like that. I have one where I go into detail about why I prefer the Greek majority text for most of the New Testament, one where I talk briefly about why I tend to side with the Roman Catholic end and include deuterocanonical books in my Bible, an older brief overview of the thoughts on translating Matthew from Hebrew, the reason why my translation is single source, and a brief one on why I decided to use the Peshitta for Paul's letters and Hebrews. I decided a few years back to make it weekly, then added a second day where I give theological reflections inspired by movies. So my primary audience is me, and it's nice that my friends get to see more of me and see how my head works. Recently I've been putting more effort into actually collecting my thoughts in an organized, systematic way. There are already people out there defending the Byzantine majority Greek New Testament position in the scholarly world. I have no problem telling people that I'm following the scholarship of Dr. Maurice Robinson, and letting him do the heavy lifting making that point. Some of my other minority opinions, like that Matthew was written in Hebrew and descendants of that original Hebrew still exist and are accessible, don't get much scholarly attention. Pursuing an academic career hasn't really been on the radar for me, but this at least gives me a place to put my thoughts and solicit feedback while I sharpen my thoughts and organize my data. I hope to get some of these thoughts to a place where I could submit them to an academic journal. That will probably involve hiring an editor, and that's a looming, daunting expense that I'm not looking forward to facing. Question 3. To what extent do you include consideration about spiritual content like seeking prayer or guidance? Q. Why did people find this question so confusing? I felt like it was very straightforward, but so many YouTubers said, I didn't understand this question. Uh. Much less than I would like to. A friend once told me that ideas progress to dreams, dreams progress to hopes, hopes progress to plans, plans progress to action. I have a dream that's just barely a dream of my blog becoming daily. If I got to that point I would love to make one day each week about prayer and answers to prayer. But that's not where I am and I don't have a definitive way to get there that aligns with my other, more pressing goals. That said, my favorite episode of Trinity Radio has been the one on two highly evidenced miracle accounts. For me, one of the problems with religious studies in general is that we rely way too much on what feels most right to us. It's one of the reasons why denominations split so quickly and easily. I've been listening to Mike Winger's series lately on women in ministry. It's something I've never done anything like a deep dive into. Pastor Winger has been really good at pointing out how egalitarian scholars very very often follow their feelings on the subject rather than the biblical mandate. I tend to be more of a virtue ethicist than a deontologist, so I still haven't heard anything from Pastor Winger that really speaks to that point. It has come up that he doesn't require women to wear head coverings in his church, and so far I have not heard anything that really separates out the one from the other in a compelling way. But that gets more to the point. I don't feel like head coverings for women and lack of leadership for women can be separated. Pastor Winger does feel that they can be separated. There's no objective way to really figure out which of us is right. I feel like virtue ethics is closer to the way to understand what the Bible is really telling us. Pastor Winger feels like deontology is closer the way to understand what the Bible is trying to tell us. At least, more than me. He is probably still closer to the virtue ethics and in more objective terms, but I'm terms of comparing him to me I'm further towards virtue ethics than he is and he's further along towards deontology than I am, and neither of us are particularly strongly inclined towards consequentialism as a general rule. There's no objective way to really figure out which of us is right. We're both really familiar with our Bibles, we've both got verses and commentaries and dictionaries and church fathers and reformers and all the rest that support our position. One of the things that has always impressed me about Roman Catholicism is the miracles, and in particular the Marian apparitions. 
I haven't looked into all of them, and of the few that I have the number of actual Marian apparitions that that actually impress me to the point that I think they warrant a second look total too, with only one of them passing my bar for something by which we could glean deeper objective truth. That one is general enough that the deeper messages we could gain are obviously not enough to persuade me to be Roman Catholic. That said, if there were a more attempts to connect controversial topics to objective means of pursuing religious truth, such as verification by miracle, as one example, that would be impressive. I took it as a sign that I was on the right track in ending every Kung Fu class with the Lord's Prayer when a request for rain to stop was answered. That said, it was hardly rigorous, it was one rainstorm on one day, and only tentatively attached to the thing I was trying to confirm. Still, that's more objective than simply, the Bible says to pray, so of course that has to apply to the end of my Kung Fu classes. And that second way seems to be the direction that a lot of the church goes, even after you can show that on this or that point they're engaging in eisgesis. Question 4. If someone asks me why they should be a Christian, what do I say? And it would depend on the situation. I don't think I've ever heard this question asked by a non-Christian that was seriously asking the question and not trying to start an argument. I don't identify as an apologist. If I don't know the person and they seem like the generally scholarly-minded type, I'll refer them to Trinity Radio. If they seem like the militantly underread type, I'll usually send them to something from inspiring philosophy. If they seem to have a lot of questions that they can't nail down, I'll send them towards capturing Christianity. If they're thinking of leaving the church, I'll refer them to Mike Winger. But that's not really my jam. I found those questions and conversations fascinating 20 years ago, but I've moved on. I'm not current in any of those issues, I'm elbow deep in stuff about the synoptic problem and trying to find more about the development of Hebrew grammar right now. The, was Jesus raised on the third day or the fourth day, which gospel do you follow? Gotchas just get, I don't care. You know me. If there weren't answers to that, do you think I'd still believe it? Then just trust that I've looked into it. If it's a more casual, hey, you're smart, why do you believe? I just answer, I follow the evidence. I honestly can't remember off the top of my head the answer to most of those gotchas. I'm at a whole different place in my journey of discovery right now. If I know the person that's asking well, then I can try to address particular problems. As often as not it's someone with a problem regarding a particular interpretation or doctrine that they just assume is the Christian way, and I'll help them find a church that mirrors their concerns. Need a welcoming and affirming church. Yeah, I can get you that. Need a church that matches your deep-seated feeling that everything is set before we're born. I know a guy that knows a guy. Want a great show every Sunday. I'll hook you up. Want a church that follows and enforces every one of those Old Testament laws. Yeah. I can get you the stuff you need. Question 5. Which beliefs or commitments do you believe are essential for salvation? A. I don't like the way this question is worded. I feel like it gives too much ground to a way of looking at this question that's counter to my own and that I think has done more harm than good. That has more to do with the way others will expand their assertions of what is essential for salvation than it does with how the question is phrased in and of itself. There are a lot of people that will say that if you say the sinner's prayer and really really believe it, then you'll be saved, no matter what you do after. Others will list a bunch of historical facts, like the virgin birth or the crucifixion or how many days Christ was in the tomb or even relatively obscure points like how many kings were recorded in Matthew. I've always found it soothed to borrow a term from my kids that if a collection of historical or theological facts are necessary to salvation, that list is never laid out in scripture. This lack leads to various lists from various groups regarding which facts are necessary and which facts are debatable. The age-old advice, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity, is only meaningful if we agree on what's essential, and listening to other responses to this question it is abundantly clear that we don't. I don't think the test at the final judgment will be either multiple choice or short answer. I believe the things I believe because the evidence supports them, not because they'll save me. In the end, there are going to be a lot of people that have perfect theology to whom Christ will say, I never knew you, Matthew 7:23, and a lot of people who know very little if anything about Christ's life that are called people after God's own heart, Acts 13:22, and to whom Christ will say, today you'll be with me in paradise. Luke 23:43. 
This leads me to the conclusion that no point of theology or history will be at play in the final judgment. If it were, then the means of salvation would be different for Abel than for us, and the author of Hebrews looking to his example would be meaningless. Hebrews 11, 4, or as James put it, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe, and tremble. James 2 19, similarly, if the final judgment is based on how you'll answer questions, then the parable of the sheep and goats very much fails to capture that Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and the claim that love is greater than faith is in error. 1 Corinthians 13 13, and it would not be love that covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8, but rather knowledge would cover the multitude of sins. A parable that many I've spoken to have found helpful is that if we're all wrong about the Trinity, and all our reasoning that leads us to that is rotten at the core, all Jesus has to do is whisper in our ear a few moments before the curtain is pulled back to reveal the Father, by the way, I'm not God, or, by the way, I'm the Father too, or whatever the right answer is and that problem is taken care of. Not that this at all represents my beliefs about the beatific vision, but it works by analogy. And if you're so cocksure of yourself as to think that you cannot have any theological errors of similar magnitude, I would find that concerning. A number of responses have included the Trinity is an essential for salvation, but I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that the majority of them would say that they have the capability of being wrong on this point. I'm a Trinitarian myself, but I'm happy to engage in dialogue with those that disagree, because the Bible doesn't lay it all out in one place and I'm happy to admit that myself and those that I have followed could have gotten this wrong. I'd be dubious of a Bible teacher that couldn't admit that. In admitting that they could be wrong, I'd bet dollars to donuts that every person who listed the Trinity as necessary for salvation would also say they don't think God will hold that against them if they were wrong about the Trinity. After all, if we Trinitarians are wrong, then we were honestly trying and we were making the best we could of the data we have. Why would that same logic not apply to someone that's rejected the Trinity? There's no simple fact that couldn't just be corrected in that way. You've been mispronouncing the name of God all this time. That's easy. Your pastor used the wrong words at your baptism. It's said like this. You ate the wrong foods. Okay, here's the approved menu. Someone who is actually interested in following the true and right judge of all the world can be fixed with a whisper. Someone who's not interested in following the true and right judge of the world can't be fixed even if they've memorized their entire Bible. None of this is actually aimed at the question, though. This is aimed at others that are going to hear this question in a particular way and at other responses. It is aimed at a way to understand this that's pretty popular, and it's a way that's been popular for a long time. Questions about what faith means and equating that to a particular set of theological and or historical facts go back at least to the opponents James was answering in his letter, and great thinkers like Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and Martin Luther have tried to reconcile the idea that faith and works are separate Galatians 2 16 with the idea that those who fail to show their faith through works have a false faith. James 2 22 minus 26 to think I've got all that figured out would take a certain amount of hubris. Fortunately, it's just about exactly the amount of hubris that I have. I don't think that the kinds of things that we need to know for salvation are really so much intellectual facts as they are truths that change who we are. They aren't historical or theological. They're observational and transformative. Parts and pieces of them do show through in other philosophers and ethicists throughout history even outside Christianity and Judaism. Conversely, large swaths of Christian and Jewish thinkers have missed these ideas completely. Even great thinkers like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and Martin Luther have noticed this and tried to make sense of it. Some of the things that I think fall into this category are these. Moral realism is true. There actually is a right and wrong. What's right and wrong is determined outside of people, not inside of individuals. See Judges 21-25 and Proverbs 14-12. We are all subject to moral judgments. Hebrews 9-27. Whatever or whomever decides what's right and wrong also rewards those that diligently seek them and punishes those who flee them. Hebrews 11, 6. Everything you have is a gift. We enter the world naked, stupid, and weak. The world was already here when we arrived. We didn't do anything to earn our first breath, meal, instruction. Anything we collect to repay 
these fists comes from outside us, or from the strength we already owe to others. The idea that we would ever be, even, when the books were balanced as hopeful, pride-induced nonsense. That's on the stuff we can see. We all know that many who have had our grace have never seen what we did for them. To presume this truth does not hold to the invisible power that animates us is unfounded at best. All people are worthy of care and attention. As above, whatever the quality you think makes someone worthy of special care and attention wasn't something they started with. If you respect the wise, we are all born foolish. If you respect the mentally strong, we are all born impatient and demanding. If you respect the physically strong, we are all born weak. If you respect the morally upright, we are all born selfish and infantile. Whoever you respect with these qualities got them from somewhere else. Even yourself. Whoever does not have the qualities you respect either wasn't given them, or refused them. They didn't give them up. When you peel back the layers of all that's been given to us, we are all the same. Since we're all the same, either we all deserve respect and attention or none of us do. You want respect and attention for yourself, so it's hypocritical to withhold it from others. This isn't to comment on the economic and psychological advantages of creating a hierarchy of respect, but everyone deserves at least a baseline of respect and attention. None of us actually live up to the moral standard. Some of us get the facts wrong. Just because we know there is a right and wrong doesn't mean we know exactly what it is. Sometimes temptation gets the better of us. Just because we know it's wrong doesn't mean it's easy. Neither of these is better than the other. You wouldn't miss your wallet less because it was taken by accident than if it were stolen. Neither is easier to correct. We get pretty set in our wrong ways, and temptation is hard to overcome. So in the end, we all fail, and it's not even possible to really know for sure who is failing worse. Failing to live up to this standard is where we all start. I've never called anyone over the age of 12, infantile, as a compliment. Telling someone to, stop being a baby, is not an invitation to become more selfish, thoughtless, or scatterbrained. What's right is ultimately what's best for everyone, and what's wrong is ultimately what's worse for everyone. It's better to be good and right, but hurt for it, than to benefit from being bad and wrong. There may be more. I'd have to think about it. Really, if you believe all of these things then you do believe in God in every significant way. You may be calling him by different syllables, but that's okay. If I told you that I didn't believe in strawberries, but I love this one red, heart-shaped fruit that's polka dotted with little black and brown seeds, you might be better off asking what I call it than trying to convince me that it's actually the thing I claim not to believe in. It might depend on how stubborn I am. In the same way, if someone says that they believe that right and wrong are objectively set, that everyone is equal before this objective set of morals, and that we all owe everything we think we earn to someone else, then I don't care what they call that thing, they're just calling God by a different set of syllables than I am and haven't fully grasped the history of God's activity in the world. For some people, it's a problem that they use a different set of syllables or don't grasp the history. Anyone who thinks that calling God by the right set of syllables is what's going to matter then you need to step up the Hebrew and Greek lessons at local churches. Another analogy that I've been working on, that is not complete, is to make an analogy between morality and navigation and between theology and magnetism. To briefly outline how that works without going into too much detail. Magnetism is real. Objective moral reality is true. Point one above. Magnetism goes back to a time before us. The things we use in moral development come from a source before us. Point 2 above. North is the same for everyone. Everyone is subject to and benefit to the same set of morals. Point 3 above. The number of people who go to the polls are vanishingly rare. The number of people who live up to the moral standard are vanishingly rare. Point 4 above. Ancient people built basic compasses that used magnetism for navigation, but they didn't fully understand the mechanism for either mannerism nor why north and or south were fixed points. Many ancient cultures combined philosophy and ethics to aim at what's right, but they didn't really understand the mechanisms for ethics or right religion. Now we understand that the world spins around an axis and that the world is full of molten iron that spins within generating the magnetic field.
Now we understand that what's really right is following God and our failings. Point four are filled in by Christ's atonement on the cross. No one has seen the molten iron core of the planet, but we infer about it from other data that is available to us. No one alive has seen Christ's crucifixion or resurrection, but we can infer it from the data available to us. Maxwell was able to explain certain qualities of light in such a way that predicted how it would react to conductors and insulators. He was right, those that opposed him were wrong. So we use Maxwell's equations to describe magnetism. Christ was able to explain certain aspects of theology in such a way that he predicted his own resurrection. His opponents disagreed with him and thought that killing him would silence him. He was right, they were wrong. So we use his understanding of God. Different modern geologists and astrophysicists will have slightly different ideas about the exact ratios and depths of molten iron and the exact scenario for the formation of the world, but they'll primarily agree on the most important points. Different theologians and pastors will disagree about exactly what the mechanism is for Christ's atonement or exactly which is the best way to understand the ethics of Scripture, but they'll primarily agree on the most important things. I think that if someone believes these things, they'll find the gospel compelling. If someone that has freaked these things naturally is sitting around the campfire of their distant mountain tribe, and a missionary finds them and explains substitutionary atonement, they'll say, I always knew that no one makes it all the way to good, yet that somehow the true and right judge of the world would reward all those who seek him. That explains how it works. Even if that tribe were entirely physicalist and naturalist, or otherwise were raised with metaphysics that were incompatible with resurrection, they would still see the value in it as an analogy. 6. What do I wish Christian YouTubers and bloggers would do differently? A. I am not a big fan of a priori reasoning, as I stated above. I wish there was less dependence on that. I wish that more people would get into the history of the church and Christian thought. I wish there were more people calling out spiritual and psychological abuse. These are things that I see trending up on Christian YouTube, though. While there will always be room for improvement, I think that Christian YouTube has some great channels out there and is headed in a positive direction. By the way, I've got a whole skit on me being a hypocrite that I'll include at the bottom of the blog post, so I've beat you to that. I think this might be an opportunity for me to highlight that if I would rather be a YouTuber. I actually think that video might be the preferred medium for transmitting theological truths over text. My personality is incompatible with it, but that doesn't make blogging objectively better. I would also like to highlight a trend that I've noticed in Christian YouTube that I find very promising. In previous generations, most areas of deep study felt more like politics than they do now. I think the first area of study to break away from this was mathematics. As math became the tool that was most effectively explaining chemistry, it started to fall away from the practice of chemistry. Then as math started to explain physics, it fell away there. We still definitely see holdovers of this in physics, though. I follow a few amateur and professional physics channels on YouTube, and there were a noticeable number of them who were excited after Stephen Hawking's death, because they were sure he had become stuck in his ways and his death would mean opening the possibility of researching things that were counter to his personal pet theories. Max Planck is credited with saying that the field of physics advances one funeral at a time. In theology, this is still very pronounced. The term, heresy, is still thrown around way too easily. If two churches can each declare the other heretical and the panel of experts who decide splits by which organization they belong to, then you know there's not an objective standard of heresy detection. As a blogger, the Christian blogosphere hasn't caught on to this at all. But Christian YouTube seems to have. I don't know if it's that people actually have to look someone in the face and call them a heretic, or if we just got lucky up have the Bible Project and Trinity Radio early on in the development of this culture or if the fact that it's largely lay-led so it's not generally a bunch of pastors afraid to lose their jobs if someone follows that other, scary theology. I could probably build a convincing case for each of these, but I'm not sure if any of them are really the reason. Inspiring philosophy won't even tell us which church Michael Jones attends. Trinity Radio has two people as the regular hosts that disagree on the complementarian, egalitarian debate. Capturing Christianity has Catholics on to explain Catholic doctrine and then Reformed theologians on the very next show to explain Reformed doctrine. It's a miracle. Side note. 
Dr. Hunter phrases this in terms of, other than question lists like this, I want there to be more question lists like this. Years ago, YouTube had a video reply feature. Sadly, it got abused and is no longer available. I've done two of the, X questions for Christians, things in the past and I rather enjoy them. Too often everyone gets into the habit of presuming the thoughts of others, and sometimes I don't even realize that I'm off the beaten path until someone asks a question in a particular way. One example of this was when Emerson Green asked about the credence given to belief, and I was shocked when he suggested 0.9 as his certainty for atheism. I explained that I can't see how anyone can justify anything more than 0.25 for the probability that we aren't in the matrix. Answers in Reason asked about what theists wish was untrue, and it was very difficult for me to answer because I just don't think in terms of what I wish were true or wasn't true. But trying to answer these kinds of questions, things where my thinking starts from a totally different place, helps me to grow and helps me to reframe some of what I'm thinking in terms others can follow and gives me a chance to point out when, where, and how I think a particular way of thinking betrayed by such questions is fundamentally flawed. If I were to add a third post per week, it would be a day where I answered personal directed questions for theists Christians non-denominationalists. I wouldn't mind being directed towards more of them, although with my current projects they might have to take a backseat sometimes. 7. What is the best thing that has happened as a result of my experience as a Christian blogger? Uh, I've been collecting my thoughts on why I think the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew and why I think that this is a better explanation for parts of the synoptic problem than Q is my 2022 project. I'm hoping to get these thoughts to a point to try submitting to an academic journal at some point either in the next few months to round out this year or next year. Being able to point people in my Facebook groups and Reddit threads back to what I've got so far has been very enlightening and helpful. It's both helped me to see how strong my argument is and where it can be strengthened. Going to school for this stuff has never been enough of God's will for me to provide the funds, so just like Moana and sailing, I. I am self-taught. I'm thankful for resources like the Master's Seminary that have made whole blocks of classes available on their YouTube page and I've watched a lot of them. I'm thankful to Lower Columbia College for providing writing classes that I was able to attend. I'm thank you for the St. Helens Writers Guild for giving me a monthly place to get feedback on my general writing skills. Still, I can only get so far on a project like that without some feedback on the specific points I make and there's just not a lot of people in my local church that have that kind of experience. Being able to cast a wider net is good for me. On being a hypocrite. Me, sneezes. Coworker, you look terrible. Me, oh, for sure. I'm sick. Coworker, aren't you the one that tells everyone to go home when they are sick? Me, yes. Coworker, so why don't you go home? Me, I don't want to take this back to my kids. Coworker, what about other people who don't want to take their illness back to their kids? Me, what about them? Coworker, shouldn't they be able to come to work sick? Me, if they do that, they might spread it to me and then I could take it back to my kids. Coworker, but might you give it to someone here and they take it back to their kids? Me, maybe. Coworker, don't you think you should do the same thing you expect them to? Me, oh. I see your confusion, now. You see, I'm what's called a, hypocrite. That means I'm allowed to require things of other people that I wouldn't do myself. Coworker, I don't think you're using that word right. Me, you don't think that's the definition of a hypocrite. Or are you saying I'm not a hypocrite? Coworker, no, I can't explain it, but you're using the right definition and you are definitely a hypocrite, 